Hello, my name is Kudo. With the help of Mandatory Cloud, we can answer the following question. What truly happened in XDG that led to Bloodwater's departure? Who was in full control of the team? Did acts of nepotism really happen? Why did the team suddenly collapse in the 2014 Spring Split, and where are those players now? This is the conclusion of the rise and the fall of Team Vulcan. On February 18, 2014, Richard Lewis published an article on XDG. Through his sources, he claimed Bloodwater has been benched and that Zuna will be the new support. Nick Wu would replace Zuna in the jungle. The community's reaction was of disbelief. Once again, XDG management pulled out a player in their starting position and replaced him with Zuna. Only this time, Bloodwater didn't swap a role, but he was instead benched. The outcries of nepotism and Zuna hate from the community grew even stronger. The changes that the community expected wasn't that, and it only led to more hate for the organization once XDG tried to cover this up. February 19, 2014, Travis Gafford, an esports journalist more respected than Richard Lewis at the time, posted his own article about the roster change on OnGamers.com. He made a point to correct Richard Lewis's leak. Using Julian Collins as a source, Travis published that Bloodwater is retiring instead, giving off the assumption that this was Bloodwater's decision to leave the team and was not forced by XDG management. Also, Travis said that Nick Wu and Zuna's roster swap were tryout only, so there was nothing solidified. From a direct source like Julian Collins, Travis's article seemed the most accurate, and the community agreed, until Marshall Alexander himself contradicted the given statement from their in-house manager and went on the record saying that Bloodwater was removed by management, not by his own wishes. Bloodwater did not retire, he was fired. On the same day that Travis Gafford's article came out, Marshall Alexander releases a statement on XD.GG about the roster update. For some reason, he devoted an entire paragraph on shaming Richard Lewis in the leaks, calling it gossip and saying there are several inaccuracies. The statement that Alexander makes, Lou Bermier has expressed that he is more than willing to be on the team for the duration of the spring split, will be incredibly significant later. February 20th, 2014, a day after the official announcement, Bloodwater does his own AMA in the League of Legends subreddit. He confirmed that he was in fact removed from the team, he also confirmed that there was a significant misunderstanding between him and Marshall about his planned retirement. Interestingly enough, Bloodwater enlightened us on the reason why he was kicked aside from announcing retirement, stating, I was removed from the team because I was not dedicated enough according to the management and owner of XDG. We will get back to this point soon. Four hours later, on the same exact day as Bloodwater's, Marshall Alexander decided to hold his own AMA regarding the situation. Needless to say, his responses were heavily downvoted. Marshall Alexander attempts to timeline everything about these retirement talks. In January, Bloodwater informed me of his intent to retire. We had a long talk about it and how we can manage his departure. It is unfortunate that despite the best intentions on both sides, we walked away with a misunderstanding where Bloodwater thought he was on the team until the time he chose to leave. And I thought he understood that we would need to make the change as soon as we had another plan to go with. We realized that misunderstanding earlier this week and we were working through how we could reconcile things when unfortunately a leaked story was released and torpedoed our discussions. So my question is, why was Bloodwater straight up fired from the organization? Well, Marshall Alexander vaguely covers this. At the time that Bloodwater told me he was going to retire, I offered to help him monetize his time after he was no longer on the active roster. Unfortunately, his actions this week have made this no longer a possibility. Marshall Alexander never gets into any of these actions. So the community did not trust Marshall Alexander's word, but looking back at it now, is his rhetoric legitimate and truthful? Well, not really. Because somehow, Marshall Alexander contradicted himself in the same exact AMA. In his third response to the thread, 
Marshall stated about Bloodwater's departure that Bloodwater was not removed from the team, he chose to retire, and we influenced the date that we would change our roster. After a Reddit user exposes the contradictory statement with Bloodwaters in his AMA, he decides to stop using the word retired overall and makes this claim. Since Bloodwater told me that this timing was not what he wanted, I changed the language that I have used and have not since said that he has retired. But of course, this is false because he used the word retire to describe the situation one hour before he made this same exact statement. This AMA was a PR nightmare for the XDG organization. All credibility from XDG and Marshall Alexander was erased due to the confusing nature of the responses and self-contradictions. However, I was able to confirm one thing related to Bloodwater's departure. There is truth behind Bloodwater's reasoning why he was kicked out, that he was not dedicated enough to the game. Mancloud tells the story and his perspective of the whole situation. Uh, I do want to talk about Bloodwater and his intentions to retire. Were you made aware of Bloodwater's intent to retire after Season 4? Yeah, I don't remember when exactly uh, we found this out, like the timeline of it, but we found out that he wanted to retire before Worlds, and our goal was to get on track and get to uh, Worlds, and we didn't want to have to find a new support player and try to mesh with them in such a short time window after the season. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me any sort of event in the house that led to the benching of Bloodwater, why he was released around week six in mid-season? So I don't really, I don't know what actually caused the benching to come up as the, like an actual topic of discussion. But one thing that stuck out to me that was pretty uh, disrespectful in my opinion was we were in a scrim and Bloodwater was alt tabbed I believe talking to his girlfriend and he actually died for first blood and I don't know that just seemed really unacceptable to me and at the time I believe he was balancing uh, league school and girlfriend and it seemed like it wasn't working out too well for him so I was actually like behind uh, you know like finding another support player I think uh, it was handled really poorly, but I still stand by like that being a, a good decision, you know. February 21st, 2014, one day after Bloodwater and Marshall Alexander's AMA, Richard Lewis publishes a scathing periodical on esportshaven.com, talking about the behind the scenes of the team and how toxic management was. Using anonymous sources and leaks, Lewis attacks the hierarchy, with claims of nepotism as well as alleging that there were signs of player coercion on the team. We dive into these unverified claims. Richard Lewis's first claim in the article is about who had complete control over XDG. Richard Lewis states, Marshall Alexander deferred complete control of team affairs to coach Kenma. Kenman makes the decisions about the team, consults with their manager Julian Collins, and gets approval from the owner. All roster changes and position swaps start with Kenma. This is rather important because we could see how Marshall operated the team. Marshall relied on Ken and Julian's influence to make the decisions, not with the players themselves. This can also tell us that Ken had complete control of the roster, making Nom Sein's statement in my part 2 video false. Mancloud can confirm all of this. So when we were uh, as Team Vulcan, I know for a fact that we made Ken in complete control of our roster because that made sense to do at the time. We put our coach in control of the roster to make an like, unbiased decision, which in hindsight might not have been the best. But um, then when it came to XDG, I have a feeling that that is correct. Uh, Julian and Ken most likely had the most input to Marshall when it comes to what was going on in the house and what decisions need to be made. So yeah. Richard Lewis's second claim revolves around how Ken operated the team. Before I dive into Ken specifically, here is what Mancloud thinks of him and his coaching style. Um, I mean, I guess we're just getting right into that. I mm -hmm. wasn't a fan of Ken's coaching style at all. Really? Yeah, if you compare him to coaches nowadays, it's honestly not even the same thing. Like, he basically had... We okay. This is, this is kind of like bringing up bad memories already. But th we basically got into uh, like an argument later on in uh, XDG, mm -hmm. where I was getting really fed up with how he w he wasn't even able to watch our games as we're playing them. Really? Yeah. It's like honestly, if, if that happened with a coach nowadays, 
they would just instantly get replaced, you know? Yeah, definitely. He, so he would basically, uh, like, backseat game if, if he watched. And I would try to get him to stop doing that, and he wasn't able to do it. So he literally would not watch our games while we played them, and he would come out afterwards and just basically go over all of our mistakes. Lewis's article asserts the notion that no player can speak up against Ken in fear they will be punished or removed from the team. Mancloud somewhat dismisses this claim. So, I could potentially see how some players feel that way, <clears throat> or rather felt that way. But also, on the other hand, uh, some of the players in our team were very uh, like soft-spoken, didn't really want to rock the boat too much, you know, they didn't really want to just, they just wanted to play. I just want to play video games, you know? Um, but yeah, like, a couple players on our team, like, they just... I don't think they're the type of people to really object to many things anyways. And then uh, I personally actually got into a, like, yelling argument with Ken over his coaching. And, I mean, I, I didn't get benched. So <laughs> I, you could use that as an example. It was like I got really irritated one day with how he was handling... Our, uh, our VOD review, and then it got pretty heated, but I mean, we, we got over it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I see. The last significant claim by Richard Lewis revolves around the first role swap. Following their performance at the World Finals, it was Kenma that came up with the idea to swap x Smithy and Zuna. The team coach decides to take a failing player in one position and place a successful one into an unfamiliar role to benefit the team. Why the move was backed by Madcloud, I will never understand. This was Madcloud's response to the role swap in general. So, in hindsight, maybe uh, I kind of ruined, or like we kind of ruined that uh, community perception of me and Smithy having this great synergy. But at the time, it didn't really occur to me at least. Um, and I don't remember who brought it up, but I know that me, Smithy, and uh, Zuna were all on board for it. And I think Bloodwater was actually the only one that opposed it. I can't actually remember what Benny thought about it. But, I mean, everybody on the team was essentially, like, the majority were on board with the decision. And, uh, yeah, it's not like it was... It's not like this was done against anybody's will. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so you guys actually put in a lot of input about it and actually agreed with it. All right. Yeah. It seemed like the logical thing to do. Uh, Zuna had jungled previously competitively for CLG Black, and he was already like the main shot caller for our team. And it makes much more sense to put the shot caller on the jungle role. And we already knew Smithy was really solid mechanically, so we knew he would do well in AD carry as well. I see. Uh, and the other thing about this role swap was that a lot of people brought up uh, this word that I've never seen talked about anywhere else in esports, and that's the word nepotism. Uh, do you believe this change was motivated by nepotism? Uh, can you verify this rumor? I can't. I honestly can't say that it wasn't because that's the problem with nepotism. It's it's a just a hanging conflict of interest. There's nothing you can do about it. People will always think that in the back of their heads. But I think that uh, the team was okay with this decision, and that didn't really occur to us at the time, at least in my perspective. <clears throat> I see. In a span of four days, rumors, contradictions, and terrible PR decisions weaken the XDG image. This cluster of events shine light on what really happened inside XDG household and how incredibly toxic it became. We're only halfway through the 2014 spring split, yet everyone knew that it was inevitable that XDG had to face off against LMQ in relegations. Week 6 with Nick Wu as the jungler, XTG lost both games against CLG and Dignitas. XTG never had a lead in both of these games due to first blood, bad ganks, and players getting caught. Both games were stomps. Gank on the turret. Oh, Link is reading this one nicely. The wild growth uh -oh. on in the end, and that's not what he wanted. The turret shot takes one down. It's still sniping out Nick Wu, and they get a double help from the turret. Uh, holding... Uh, lanes that have already been ganked or looking uh -oh. to try and pick something up. Uh -oh. Smithy! Uh-oh. And he's flashing. He's running. He's done. Cutie pie. Nick Wu's coming in go. from the back, though. Can he answer? He finally needs to get something going here. Cutie pie does have his flash and his uh -oh. barrier. That's a cross. Oh, no. oh, the E still hit versus the flash. Vault Breaker hits. 
February 25th, 2014, the roster change everyone had waited for happened. Xmithi and Zuna returned to their original roles. Sheep from Curse Academy would fill in to be the support for the rest of the split. On the first game with the original roster and Sheep, they won a decisive victory against second place Cloud9. Sheep's play in this game was very impressive, during laning phase and even the late game team fights as well. Lemon Nation very low, that's gonna force a flash if they wanna get this, no! Sheep comes in and gets the kill for XDG. Doesn't look like they can do Whoa, much about it. Oh, they bring Sheep in a little bit more! Where's the rest of the herd though? They're trying to come in behind him, there's Betty! Sheep is somehow still alive, that's one hell of a coat he's wearing! It's gonna be the Nexus turrets going down, 53 minutes into the game, XTG takes down Cloud9! What a game by XTG, 22 kills to 18, 52 minutes, they take him down! It seemed like the team was rejuvenated again, just like when Bloodwater joined the team and helped Vulcan go to the playoffs exactly a year and one month ago from this game. However, for the rest of the split, XTG only won two games out of the next 14 left in the season. XTG was to face off against LMQ and relegations. Was there at any point in the season where you sort of realized that, or did you accept the fate that you were going to face LMQ and relegations? Uh, yeah, that was like a terrible feeling because we, we've been watching LMQ play uh, just, you know, occasionally beforehand, seeing the hype build up and it's like, okay, these guys are uh, pretty beasts. Um, great. So if we lose this game, we're going to have to play them. Uh, yeah, I mean, at least it was before um, auto relegation. So at least I think it was. So we at least had a chance to fight for the spot, even though we were at last place. But um, yeah, it was a pretty terrible feeling. And then, of course, they make it into the LCS in the next split. They're like, I believe they got number two, they number did, three yeah. or something. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. <clears throat> Against a team with massive early game presence with crisp communication and aggressive objective control, XTG was nowhere near the favorites coming into this match. Game 1, every 5v5 team fight, Zhao Wei Xiao lands a shockwave that hits multiple XTG members and always turns the fight around. But Benny falls, one for one though. Big three-man shock is gonna be a lot for that one. Man Cloud falls as well. Now Zuda chased oh. down, only Sheep alive. He falls, everyone goes down. It's a five for two to LMQ. After a string of fights, LMQ wins under 30 minutes. Game two, every member of XDG was outlaned and there were considerable mistakes. For example, XMITI kicks Vasily into the team but Moore uses wild growth and it knocks three members of XDG in the air. And LMQ wins the fight. In with his ulti if they get a pick. Smithy wants it though, kicks in, Vasily gets knocked up by Lulu though, here comes the fight, Moore is low, Man Cloud goes down right away without getting a shockwave down, here comes Zuna trying to turn it back around, but it's a 2 for 0, 3 for whoa, 0 so far, the whoa. dive still comes in, no name, forces the flash out of Zuna. Game 3, Vasily closes out the game by 1v2ing Man Cloud and Zuna. Shao Wei Shao doesn't need it. Man Cloud taking some big damage. Vasily oh! pops the calling. There's the zone. Yes, Zuna forced away. Man Cloud flashes. It's not going to be enough. Down goes Vizzilli's the kill. The going. chase and he gets Zuna. Two for zero. The flash away from Sheep. Here's the jump in for Shao Wei Shao. This could be the game winning push. LMQ going down the front door All inhibitor. Right. In the series, XTG only obtained eight kills while LMQ got 42. Vasily's overall KDA was 11 kills, 0 deaths, and 22 assists. XDG was officially eliminated from the NALCS. Benny was the first person on the team to announce his retirement from being a League of Legends professional player. He retired to pursue education. In 2015 Spring Split, Benny subbed for Counter Logic Gaming in Week 1 after Skara, the coach, and Zion Spartan, the actual top laner, were suspended due to poaching allegations. He did fine, winning against Team 8 but losing to Team Liquid. The last interview he had with Travis Gafford, he lived with Link after he published the Dunzo Manifesto, a piece of writing which I will cover in the future. Here's Benny's latest update. I'm like, uh, so I'm Austin's roommate slash mom, where I, uh, sometimes I drop him off in class. Oh, dad, that's a more manly, um, title, but yeah, sometimes I drop him off in class. Other times I'm studying myself, uh, as well, or trying to get, like, a job in software engineering as well. Um, aside from that, yeah, it's just, I barely play any games now. My, um, in case you're about to ask if I still play League, I don't. I, I wasn't don't going to, but thanks for any. I don't know what I'm doing here, actually. <laughs> uh, 
No, both of my accounts decayed from like masters to like plaid and diamond. So yeah, tough times, tough times. Hey, didn't so you guys are literally roommates at Berkeley? Ah, uh, yeah. Right now we 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 live in an apartment. That's very cute. More like family. Okay. Today, he is no longer active in the community as his last tweet was in August 18th, 2015. Out of everyone in Vulcan, x Mitty found the most success and today, he is still regarded as one of the most consistent junglers of North America. After Vulcan and XDG, x Mitty became the jungler for Canologic Gaming for all of 2015 and 2016. In the 2017 summer split, x Mitty joined Immortals as their main jungler. Uh, what are the differences for you playing on Immortals vs CLG? Um... I feel like uh, the communication is more lax in Immortals, but um, CLG is much more like how do I say like sophisticated? <laughs> like like communications are like more sophisticated, so like a lot of specifics. Here it's just like pretty general, just like I right, do this, do that, and then they take care of the micro stuff. And yeah, like the like the atmosphere is just different than. I, like the past, like it, make, it makes me remember, reminds me of like Vulcan. Oh, okay. Is that a good thing? Um, it's a good and bad thing, I think. As of the making of this video, Immortals is currently at number one in the standings. Xmithy still streams today. You could check him out when he streams at night and join his Discord full of memers. The link will be in the description below. For Bloodwater, he made true to his promise to retire after Season 4, in order to continue his education. On April 8, 2016, Bloodwater wrote a book called The Art of the Support. It covers the fundamentals of the support role and how support should play in the early, middle, and late game. The link to purchase this book will be provided in the description below. Today, Bloodwater continues his education. He received an eSports scholarship to play for UC Irvine's Collegiate League of Legends team. He studies computer science and hopes to be inside the artificial intelligence field. Zuna and Ken are no longer inside the League of Legends community. They are now professionals in Heroes of the Storm. Currently, Zuna and Ken are in Team Navantic. Zuna is the team captain, and Kenma is the coach. On August 18, 2016, Bud Light and Machinima created an 8-minute documentary on Zuna. It revolves around how he dropped out of school to pursue professional gaming. The documentary talks about how Zuna was massively hated in the League community. It also specifically highlights the unknown but yet great things Zuna has done to help his family. The link will be in the description below. Nomsan and Julian Collins still works inside the esports industry. Today, Nomsan is the social media director for Tempo Storm and Julian Collins works for Jinx Clothings. As for Marshall Alexander, he is no longer inside the esports industry. Sheep today still plays League competitively. He is currently the support player for Tempo Storm. As for Muffin Cutie, he just plays video games now and streams casually. He has no plans to continue being a professional League of Legends player. After XDG and Vulcan, Man Cloud up for Complexity Gaming during the 2014 summer split. Prawley had to attend to family obligations back home, and Man Cloud still lived in what used to be the XDG house. Unfortunately, Complexity lost both games that week. Mancloud has since joined a few amateur and challenger teams, but ultimately none were successful for varying reasons. I'll let him explain how he's doing today. Uh, from your social media, it seems like you got you are still a free agent, still looking for a team. Uh, what is your motivation to continue being a professional in uh, League of Legends today? Um, so at the moment, I am playing for Team Sky. The only reason I haven't changed the free agent in my Twitter is because I'm not contracted yet. But um, yeah, like I know I'm still a good player at this game, and I want to just find that chance to prove it, you know. And uh, I'm hoping Team Sky is a way to do it. I know that when I stopped by your stream, you got hit by a duck. Oh. Jesus fucking Christ. Being attacked by ducks. Holy shit. Uh, can you tell me, uh, can you tell me a bit about those ducks or how, how's your streaming life in general on Twitch? Yeah, so uh, a few months back, my girlfriend bought four ducks, and uh, they've grown into quite the nuisances. Uh, there's probably there's a clip floating around of me playing, and then just in the middle of a game, a duck just flies out and just attacks me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they're pretty cute. They can get loud sometimes. People will spam Ducker Z in my Twitch chat whenever they start to make noise. But <clears throat> yep. 
After doing this series on Team Vulcan, I give my utmost support for Mancloud and his endeavors to make it back into the LCS again, where he once ruled the mid lane. Today, he still streams, and occasionally his ducks will make an appearance on stream as well. His Twitch link and Twitter will be provided in the description below. I highly recommend you check out every single link, including Mancloud's. Team Vulcan was a team destined for greatness and longevity, but was thrown down into disbandment due to incompetence. A team that had a severe disconnect with internal management and fans, which led to many PR disasters that corrupted the Vulcan and XTG name. Questionable decisions made by all involved in the organization created the downfall of the team skill-wise. No single member of Vulcan or XT team can be solely blamed for its downfall, no matter how many people will love to point the finger at the brothers. My name is Kudo, and thank you for watching my documentary on the rise and the fall of Team Vulcan. I can tank it, I can tank it. That shit's so free. That was a 4 versus 5. <laughs> <laughs> Good job.